treat people want to give charitably and uh you know and they're not motivated by just by taxes right i mean people are motivated because they want to give back to their community and to to to, to help out right uh, but taxes can be a component and you I mean they want to be efficient about it right if i can if i can give to my community and have the government chip in a little bit more money right I, I'm, I'm all for that right you know if i can get a little bit uh, more of a tax write-off so to speak do, by being a little bit more efficient with my charitable giving and have it you know uh you know deduct from my income in, you know in a more efficient way that leaves more for for me and more to for me to be able to give as well so you know we still want to care about uh, taxes and and we're, we're we're facing some uncertainty not just with the state tax potentially going down with some of these proposals that we would discuss, but also uh, probably even more likely, I don't know about Seth, but I think it's probably even more likely that the, we'll see some radical changes to income taxation that we'll talk about, particularly for those making over $400,000. And, you know, that may make a difference for people. They may actually give. Oh, no, we lost, we lost Ed. Mm. Um, okay, I'm, I should be back. <laughs> you are back. <laughs> I don't know how that happened, but, uh, but that, uh, just a quick final point, you know, that the, the income taxation and the, the uncertainty behind that is probably just as important for, for people to kind of muddle through and, and figure out as much as the estate tax. And uh, Seth, are you, are you getting more concerned about income, estate tax, or both? Well, you know, that's, I'm glad you brought that up. You know, there were three points, you know, that I'm taking away from what you said. Number one, I find as well that charitable giving really doesn't overall, I mean, there are exceptions, but charitable giving has to do more with the passion than for tax planning, you know, especially in the type of charity. I mean, if it's, you know, a charity, say, you know, that's specific, say cystic fibrosis or something, most people are giving to that charity for, for reasons very different than tax planning. Um, families first as, as, as well. Um, and, you know, part of, part of our job, you know, as Chris, as Chris did in the beginning is, is to educate people as to what the charity does, right? Um, but also, you know, there's a couple of things we're gonna talk about that one most importantly is a donor advice fund where you know, you may have an idea where you want to give, right, you know, helping out the community, whatever, you know, there's always things that come up, earthquakes, or, you know, unfortunately, hurricanes, as we're seeing and things like that, you may want to have, you know, your money somewhere for, you know, unfortunately, the next disaster, because there'll be one. The second point is, um, I do agree that uh, I'm more concerned about income taxes and estate taxes. A lot of people think, well, you know, the exemption's really high. So bringing it down to say 5 million or whatever it is really makes a lot of sense, you know, and it shouldn't be that hard to get past because even at $5 million a person, 10 million a couple, really does infect a lot of people. However, if you look historically, which is interesting, the estate tax exemption, I've been doing this longer than I'd like to admit, it really doesn't <laughs> ever seem to go down. And it's not a popular tax, you know, interestingly, interestingly enough, you know, even at this gigantic exemption, how many people are subject to, how many people are, are, are at risk of estate tax of $22 million a couple, <laughs> not, you know? I don't know about you, but I'm pretty far away from it, right? It doesn't affect a lot of people. When you, you know, talk to the guy on the street, you know, he'll tell you, well, you know, it's not fair that, you know, the state's actually just very appealed. It's not fair to be taxed twice and the family farms and this and that. And it's, it's just not a popular tax in both parties, interestingly enough. So I don't see a lot happening with that. Also, it tends to be a political tool even at five million, it's just not a big revenue raiser. Um, so I don't see how, I don't see anything happening with that. That said, you know, I'm still going to encourage people to do some planning with respect to estate taxes because I haven't been <laughs> I've been wrong before, although not frequently, right? Income taxes, 
our revenue raiser. Okay. So, and you know, there's a lot of expenses. And even though this Congress doesn't seem to seem to be able to get a whole lot done, somewhere someone's going to figure out that they're going to need to raise more money. Okay. So I do think on the income tax front, we do need to be mindful of that. And then what we could talk, you know, about some of the some of the techniques as, as we progress through here on what people should be thinking about in terms of income tax planning as opposed to state tax planning. And as a teaser, you know, we'll talk about things like certain charitable trusts that are really more income tax motivated than estate tax motivated um, and donor advised funds and, and, you know, charitable gift annuities, things like that, where you're getting a lifetime um, deduction as opposed to say one thing, you know, I work with, I work with uh, charities myself. I'm on the board of the United Way in Miami. And I'll tell you one thing we really don't like is, you know, people putting in their wills, you know, there's, you know, if everyone in the world dies, you know, then we'll give it to charity, you know? And so, or, or charitable gives at death because, you know, charitable giving at death doesn't really give you a whole lot of an income tax benefit, right? So one thing I will say as far as the technique that we'd encourage people, you know, to think less about is putting charities, I mean, it's better than not, you know, but not putting charities in, in your will, but putting it, getting, focusing on the income tax benefit, and then you see where your dollars go, you know, you, you, you give Chris a call and say, hey, you know, what are you guys up to? What's, what's going on? What are, some, what are some of the changes you're making to the community? What are the programs? Uh, that, that's really um, my take on it. And, and again, I think, you know, a good part of this program, um, as it was designed, is to talk about income taxes. And that, and that's really, you know, the segue of you know, emulating what you both shared is, you know, families first, thinking about organizations that you're a part of and, and making that impact with where you can actually, you know, take a step forward with your income that you're making and being able to offset that by thinking about families first in such a way, um, talking to your existing relationships and your, and your, your financial teams and really thinking about those conversations philanthropically. How do we make sure that we can make an impact today, but at the same time towards planned giving, you know, think of that conversation earlier than later. Uh, next slide, please. And, and Chris, I'll make a real quick point that was on that last slide, whether somebody's gonna make large gifts to either their children or grandchildren or to charities, you know, whenever it's a larger amount, you know, have some accountant or financial planner kind of crunch the numbers because, you know, when you're talking about larger gifts, um, the collaborative effort on advisory can really give a lot of results and prevent that donor's remorse uh, that Seth had mentioned earlier that, you know, uh, because there are, you know, cases like this one case back in 2012, somebody gifted millions of dollars to their kid and they ended up selling, you know, suing the attorney, you know, because, oh, you convinced me to give too much. But if you have a projections of people's financial and retirement and, hey, I'll, I can afford to give this much with and still live comfortably according to my standard of living, that really helps, uh, you know, whether it's giving to charity or whether it's giving to individuals. And, and so uh, I just want to kind of make it get commercial to, for the attorneys and accountants and advisors to kind of work together on evaluating that. But let's go back to the next slide and kind of start on some of the uh, proposals that are out there. Um, the, what we've got here is just, and there's a little bit, there's an, also an ad, additional handout, uh, I, I, uh, material. I don't know if we passed that out, Chris, the, the additional handout with the additional slides that I put together on these. Did we? I can't recall. Not yet. Okay. Well, we, <laughs> we have a little bit more detail and, and, and Seth and I aren't going to go into the nitty gritty of these tax bills that are out there because like he said uh, they're not going to become law as is anyway there's going to be a lot of sausage making on the hill on washington dc and some of this might become law some of it might not and, and they may pick and choose little pieces here and there but the the two big bills that have kind of gotten people uh, worried back in april and march uh, was senator sanders and senator whitehouse they, they came out with this for the 99.5 percent act which would 
you know, radically change a lot of the estate, you know, close a lot of estate and gift tax loopholes and go back to that, you know, $5 million number or even lower for generation skipping transfer tax um, or, or even below that three and a half million, I think it was. And then there was another bill called the STEP um, bill, sensible taxation and equity promotion that would be even more far reaching. It would get rid of the step up in basis and realize income tax at, uh, uh, at death. Uh, for capital gains. And so between these two, it's a pretty big sea change. Um, President Biden released his American Families Plan, didn't really touch on the estate tax at all, but he still mentioned this idea of the step up in basis. Um, Seth, did you spend much time studying these plans, these bills? Well, yeah, I mean, um, <laughs> not as much as I should have, but the reality is, you know, if you look at the last, I spent a lot of time, again, this will date me. I spent a lot of time on a, the green book, actually, that the Clinton, Bill Clinton put mm -hmm. together, which was what, a long time ago. And, you know, you see a lot of the same things being brought up in legislation and, and the loss of step up in basis at death has been something that's been kicked around for a long time. And then, you know, particularly accounts will say, well, trying to figure out basis, you know, on things that, um, you know, that, that were purchased, uh, you know, a jillion years ago. It, it, it's just administratively going to be real difficult, right? But you know, so, Seth, we did manage to get through that in 2010, that year when we had, didn't have the estate tax. Remember, George Steinbrenner died and didn't have to pay any estate tax. You, you were around back then. And we had this, you know, uh, if you... The, the trade-off was if you didn't pay any estate tax, you didn't get the full step up in basis. And, and it was a carryover basis with the modifications, right? Kind of like what the proposal is now. So we lived through it. And I, I think there's an interesting change since 2010. All the brokerage firms have to track basis better than they used to. So is it as hard as it used to be? Perhaps, you know, there's still going to be some cases of old and cold farmland that was purchased by gifted by grandma 30 years ago and things like that but you know a lot of people's brokerage accounts track the basis pretty well now that maybe in 2010 i'm not sure that was the case i, I would agree i i i would i mean i would agree in part in the sense that certainly that is more there's more of a risk if that's the word there's there's a much greater chance of something like that passing and again well, I may think I may think certain things will or won't pass. Um, that's a revenue raiser, right? So, you know, right back in the day, you know, 2012, you know, it's a long time ago, right? And you know, so and and you know, in the, in the prior green books, so certainly I would agree with that. That there's, it's going to be, it's a tough, it's a it's a tougher argument, you know. That's saying, well, it's going to be really hard to figure out basis, you know, and so, so there is a, there is a good chance for that. There's, and there's different flavors of it. I mean, to get hit with a tax when you make a gift of low basis property, um, that's one, I'm not even going to predict the chances of that happening, that on the charitable side, that will encourage, I think, and, and, and you know, people to give low basis property or low basis stock, you know, in particular to charity, because otherwise you're going to pick up the capital gain if you want to give it to the next generation, you know. And then, of course, there's always people, there's always estate planners, you know, like me and Ed, who find ways around whatever, whatever's passed, you know. Um, sure. But, but no, I think they're, you know, as far as, you know, are they going to, are they going to, change the state tax exemption, who knows? You know, are they gonna change this? Who knows? So you've got to plan either way. I mean, should you make gifts of low basis property to your children or to the next generation now? You know, maybe, I mean, you've got to take, again, you've got to crunch the numbers as said pointed out. You've got to, you know, look at what your overall profile is. Um, one technique I'll just throw in that I've been using a lot is, um, and different people, you know, some people agree and disagree is, you know, the self-settled trust, not in Florida, but in, in other states, 
you could set up a trust, say um, Nevada, South Dakota, Delaware, and, and I'm a fan of New Hampshire for a bunch of reasons. You could be a beneficiary of your own trust, and I'm overstating that, but you could kind of be a beneficiary of your own trust um, and still have it outside of your taxable estate. You know, you could be a standby and this and that. So, so look, the thing is to, you know, we say we want it, we want to educate people. I, I love, I love quoting Tupac actually, who made a good quote of saying, I can't, you know, one man can't change the world, right? But I could teach people who on the aggregate can, right? So that's, that's our job, you know? And even if we just raise the issues, hey, you know, um, we want, you know, we want you, whether you're an accountant, attorney, potential client, financial services to call each other, say, hey, what are you guys seeing? What should we do here? we got a client who's got low basis properties, worried about capital, you know, step up, loss of step up at death. He's worried about gifting low basis. He doesn't want to give his, his kids, he's 40 years old. He's got, he's got a startup. He doesn't want, he wants to build wealth out of his estate, but he doesn't want to give everything to a six and four year old, right? So there are a number, you know, there are a number of things and it's just a matter of don't throw your hands up, you know, talk to, talk to, you know, someone on this call, talk to, talk to Chris, talk to Ed, talk to me, talk to, you know, Gabby, whoever. And if we don't know the answer, we could always point you um, to the right individual. But again, you know, you know, the takeaway is, you know, I, I think there's a focus on on the income tax, um, especially with this administration. It's something that people are used to now. Now, there's another thing I just want to bring up, you know, retroactivity. So, you know, you're going to go back to January on, on transactions that happen. I really don't like that. I personally and people disagree with me. Um, I think I'm in the minority actually on this that think it's unconstitutional to do that. Um, certain proposals were, were unconstitutional. There was actually a wealth tax that was proposed at one point um, by um, my mental blocking um, Warren, but that got she hasn't really talked about that in a while. So you know, so again, as we as we kind of progress through some of the taxes we're looking at, um, you know, we'll give you some ideas on the way on what you can do. But, you know, there's a lot of flexibility, right? So, you know, wh when someone comes to you, a client, or if you, or, or if you individually, I don't know who all is on this call, but if you individually have an issue, you know, most things we can solve, you know, and if you've got low basis property, you know, you really need to see, you know, you're at least your accountant. And those are the things to think about, especially with the marginal tax rates going up. Um, how is it really impacting, you know, the budget bill that the new administration is implementing? Um, where do uh, business owners, individuals really understand and how to approach some of these strategies that um, Seth has mentioned um, and some of the ideation behind the tax bill? How does it really impact us overall? And if we move to the next slide, we'll dive deeper into uh, some of the new proposed um, you know, tax bills that are being discussed at the moment. And you know, Ed, if you can you know, chime in and just, I guess, you know, share a little bit of context, a little bit more around the Green Book and, and what's going on with the, the, with the budget bill this year, it really helps elaborate to the audience, you know, how to start thinking differently. Yeah, and you know, the interesting point that Seth made about the, the step bill that was on the last slide, that it was retroactive to the beginning of 2021, which I, I, I don't see that as, passing even a lot of democrats don't want to make something retroactive to be the beginning of this year for income tax rates but uh and so I, I don't think the you know the biden administration will basically get beyond that so the the real you know rubber hits the road so to speak is you know what's going to get into this you know reconciliation bill and i thought we might have something soon but there was in the news just the last week the house passed a resolution that basically punts a little bit to the tax writing committees, basically saying we are going to raise revenue, we're going to pay, increase some taxes to pay for some of the spending and this deficit down a little bit. But the Mo Ed, you froze. Let me finish up. Chris? Yes, there weren't details, so we didn't know. You know, are they going to okay. put some uh, Bernie Sanders? 
Oh, okay. Uh, you know, but in the, the the green book is a proposal from the Biden administration, uh, and that would again it would increase the uh, income tax rate on the top earners back to thirty nine point six percent. Uh, but probably even more important and more concerning to people, particularly, you know, if you've got a lot of retirees who are, you know, they're, they're living on their investment income that is, you know, coming from capital gains investments, you know, it's the capital gains tax rate, particularly for those who are selling a business, for instance, the, you know, they built up all their wealth in a business and they'll be selling a business uh, for large capital gain. Uh, anybody making over a million dollars, the capital gains rates might go up under the Biden Green Book proposals up to the same as the ordinary income tax rates, which would more than double pretty much the income tax rates. So that's what we, where we at now, you know, as far as how much of this is gonna get in the bill or not. Um, there's also some bills out there to, to change some donor advice funds and put some restrictions on those and make sure that those pay out a little bit quicker. Seth and I were talking about that bill just the other day. Uh, uh, emailing back and forth on that one, but it, it's hard to say. I think what we what we've got, and you can go to the next slide unless you had a few thoughts on that, Seth. Um, you know, the, the nutshell is we, we care why these, you know, what's in these bills because we want to try to be nimble and make sure that we don't do something rash that would, you know, we're going to regret later. As Seth said. You know, we're still recommending people make gifts. Uh, we just may be recommending that they make them in different ways and with more flexibility built in. Some other thoughts, uh, Seth, on those the, the latest bills to come out and the reconciliation bill. And, uh, any thoughts on those? I do think raising the rate to 39.6 is going to happen. If I had to get that to revenue raiser, I think I, that's I a little bit of that. an easier sell. You know, you've got... I hate to pick on someone, um, and I won't mention names, Joe Manchin, um, yeah. who's, you know, you got a few people like that, but, you know, and, 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 you know, I'm not an expert on West Virginia, but I think in some of the states where, you know, you may have different, well, let's just call it different, different earning, different, different income numbers. I mean, look, you know, my firm, is actually based out in New York. And New York is essentially, um, it's almost like it's a different currency. You know, you, you know, you're paying in euros instead of dollars, right? So you're gonna have, you're gonna have a lot more New Yorkers affected by this 39.6 than you're gonna have in some of these other states, right? So I think you, I think you'll find that some of the Democrats that are on the fence are gonna be in some of these, I don't want to call them swing states, but in some of these other states. And it's just going to be an easier sell. So the New Yorkers aren't going to like anything, right? None of this is going to be good for people in New York, other than if they get some of their state and local tax deductions. I'm getting a little granular, but for any New Yorkers out there, one thing that was really a disaster, which was I used to call it the blue state special, was for all the people that voted against Trump, you know, the penalty was that they would lose their ability to duck to deduct state income taxes against the federal income tax, um, the federal income taxes, which is a big deal because New York income taxes is a big number. So if you could reduce your, your federal, right, by how much you pay to New York, that's, that's a big thing. Now that you can, it's really expensive and that could be, I live in Boca and that could be why, um, there's you hear a lot of New York accents in Boca. I mean, we have Californians here. So, so that's going to pass. Okay. Um, and I, again, I could, I could be, I, there's a song that says I could be wrong, but I'm not. <laughs> so, um, you know, and then again, I think on some of this converting capital gain to ordinary income at a certain rate, you know, New York already does that again, not that New York's a, you know, litmus test, but there's no preferential capital gains rates there. So there's a good chance of that. Look, these, you know, the people that the Democrats that are on the fence or in, you know, in red states or whatever, they might, some of these might be a little bit of an easier sell. You may have Republicans, you know, that are, are willing to cross the aisle on some of this. You know, there are Republicans that have crossed the aisle on things, you know? So 
so some of this is going to pass, you know, again, um, extra credit if you know who Niels Bohr is. <laughs> Unfortunately, I took physics, so I know who that is. Um, but in any event, um, again, not predicting, we can only guess what we think is going to happen based on, for those people in financial services, right? You know, we're trying to predict future performance based on past performance, which is a very dangerous game. Um, but we know generally what we can do is we can look at the graphs over years, right? Longer the better. You have dips, you know, you have what is it, the valleys, the peaks, and all that. And over time, you know, the graph code <laughs> tends to go up, right? So over time, you know, maybe not in this administration, maybe in the next, you know, those, those people who do planning and the pet and the lot doesn't go through that they were planning around. I'm just not sympathetic again to the buyer's remorse. Um, you know, it's a matter of doing planning. You know, I talked about, you know, self-settled trusts, which, which gives some people, um, you know, some pause as, as concern whether they work or not, and if you're in part of the state, but there's other things you can do. There's family limited partnerships. There's ways um, beyond the scope of this call of still having access, whether it's a management fee or whatever, they're still having access to money that's given away even to a four and six year old. Um, other things, you know, we're kind of integrating estate planning with income tax planning a lot of the time with, so with, and with charitable planning and some of the things that might be, you know, are still available. Look, there's still valuation discounts. That's always been a hot thing for people. Clients always come in and start talking about discounts, right? That's still available. They're still planning with that. Um, and then I don't see that going away. Um, and then I don't know if it's, you know, I don't know where we are in our time, but, you know, just to get, just to get into some of the techniques, one of the things, and, and I hope I'm not stealing anyone's thunder here, but one of the things that, um, that did change that I think affected charitable giving, certainly United Way was worried about it, was a higher standard deduction. So, you know, $24,000 a year. Uh, especially if you're not, a, especially if you don't have state income taxes or whatever, um, you don't have big itemized, you're just going to take the $24,000 and you're, you, you may not get a whole lot of benefit, right, for charitable giving. So, for example, if you're the guy who gives, say you don't have a lot of other itemized deductions, you're given $20,000 a year, every year, you're not getting a whole lot of benefit, tax benefit from that right so you may say okay there's something there's something that's that's popular that was talked about you know a couple of years ago but that's still popular and that's gift that's gift bunching and charitable lead trust right so what's gift and i think bunching? we've got those points on the on the couple slides forward seth too maybe we can jump am i getting slide. ahead of myself or no 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 that's okay we, we already we we're going to a couple of thoughts i just don't want to run out of time actually. before we get to that <laughs> Go, go one so, slide back, Gabby, and uh, we've got, uh, you know, some of the charitable. Go, go ahead, Seth. I just thought we'd jump ahead. I just ahead wanted to hit. Planning. I just, <laughs> just wanted to hit because I've run, and I'm sure Ed's had this problem too. You know, I run, I look at my watch, and I got one minute left, and I'm only halfway through. I'm like, oh, my God. So, so, again, to avoid that, I think the gift bunching, and again, and this, is, this is a pitch for the, for the donor advice funds of the world which is, look, you give $20,000 a year for the next 10 years, right? You're just not getting a whole lot of an income tax benefit, right? So what you can do is, you know, you're going to be doing that, right? So say, you know, you're giving to um, families, you know, families first, right? So you, you, you know that, you know that you're, you're going to give some amount over the next several years, right? But you have, you know, you want to get an income tax deduction now. So you do is you set up a, you, you do either one thing. You do a gift bunch or you do a charitable remainder trust. What a gift bunch is, is you just, you just make a big contribution to a donor advice fund, right? Of a hundred thousand dollars or whatever it is. Okay. And that goes into your donor advice fund. 
And then you get the deduction this year. It sits in a donor advised fund and you dole it out over the next several years to, you know, families first or whatever charity you want to give it to. Um, there's some restrictions. And of course, technically the donor advice fund, um, um, you know, custodian gets the, you know, gets technically has, has say over what you, you know, who you give it to. But that said, um, that bunching is an important thing, right? And we recommend, I recommend almost to everyone who gives a charity, set up a donor advice fund. So I don't want to get a call December, you know, the week before Christmas and New Year's. Oh no, I need to make a charitable gift. I don't know who to give it to, right? And then you got to scramble to set up a DAF. So set up a DAF now, right? And it's there, you know? Um, and you can do that bunch. Another technique that's popular that I like, a charitable lead annuity trusts, which is just essentially um, you, you set up a trust, you put assets in there, you agree that you're going to make, you know, gifts of 10, 20, $100,000 a year over the next 10 years. And the trust requires that. And then you get a deduction in the current year based on the present value of that annuity. So you agree to give an annuity to charity. You get a present value, you get deduction based on the present value. The discount rate is very low, right? So how much is... $20,000 worth now and how much is going to be worth in 10 years, right? So $20,000 in 10 years, you know, for, for me is worth five cents, right? 20 years and million years. So, but you still get a deduction. You're still going to get a deduction, say worth 18,000, whatever it is. So you're getting a very big income tax, income tax deduction this year for an annuity over several years. So you can pick and choose when you want to get your big charitable income tax deduction. You don't have to do it on a year by year basis because the charities need the money then. Charities need as much money as possible immediately, right? But um, you, can, you can get your deduction now without having to give it to, to the particular charity um, immediately. You know, what if Chris, you know, says the wrong thing, right? Talks out of school, right? You might just say, you know what? You have to, you know, I'm going to give to the Humane Society, right? But getting Never aside, gonna it gives you, um, it does give you some ability. It does give you some peace of mind. Even if you do plan to give to families first, it gives you the ability to not do that. And we encourage that. You know, you're going to give, some people, they're just going to give to charity. As, as Ed and I spoke, you know, the giving to charity is just really not tax motivated. It might be in a particular year where you have a big bonus or you sell a business or whatnot. Um, but then over the years, you can just give and choose what you want. There's been proposals to force donor advised funds, the same, the same requirements as private foundations where they have to give out 5% a year. I've, I've written articles and I, I don't know. And again, we talked about this before. I think it's kind of, dumb personally because most of the donor advised funds I see there is money's going in and comes out a lot quicker than it comes out in a private foundation it's usually money say it's money from a charitable lead trust whatever where people do want to make a charitable contribution they just don't know which charities yet and, and again first really is you know where there are ways to you know connect you know with the team your advisors and really think of ways that having that conversation to understand the way that these strategies are going to impact your family and how you can look at families first as a legacy, um, a part of your planning. Uh, some of the strategies that you mentioned, I think, are, are really uh, key uh, based off of what's going on with uh, the income tax uh, changes and how they're impacting you know, people that are, you know, making significant income. Um, and Ed, what you mentioned as well of how to really approach uh, these techniques, but just the way that we're looking at certain types of trust plans, um, using certain types of techniques where you're able to look at a charity and think of a different approach. That's really what we're looking at, using donor advice funds, life insurance, um, looking at securities, 
um, looking at these vehicles to really think of a way, not only the impact with, uh, you know, monetary resources, but, you know, potentially other types of resources that a donor buys fund can receive. So, well, you know, if I could jump in on you, Chris, you know, and, and you know, I, I, I really want to emphasize that, you know, look, you could set up a donor advice fund online with Fidelity or out of a Cracker Jack box, but the benefit you do get from an organization like Families First, right, and that's a very important thing is the resources, right? So, I mean, you could go Google this and that, but, you know, you don't know what you're finding on there, right? So by, by having, by using the resources, you know, a family's first and people that are educated there, um, you know, hey, you think, you know, we're not, you know, we don't expect y'all to be taking notes and memorizing everything, you, you know, you hear in this, um, in this conversation. We might think, you know, you know, a client just walks in tomorrow and says, I got this, you know, I'm selling my business um, and I really got to do some planning, you know, and you're like, yeah, that's a good idea. When are you selling your business tomorrow? Right. So you, you, you can, you know, maybe other law firms in some places will kick them out of the office because they couldn't do pre-sale planning, but there's still a lot of tax planning you can do, you know, that's income tax deduction based. And look, Anytime, and again, reach out to Chris, reach out to me, reach out to Ed or, or anyone on the staff of Families First, and you have that resource. And that's really important. And it's not, a, it's different. You know, Google, even the stuff on Google, you'll find it's just not nothing. Every single client situation is just different. It is what it is, you know. And again, what's, you know, I mentioned the craft technique and I mentioned the bunching technique. What's the difference between that? The difference is, at the end of a charitable lead trust, the assets go back to the family. So that's also got an estate planning twist. I didn't even remember to say at this conversation, right? So you have a client that comes in and says, you know, doesn't have a next generation, doesn't have children. There's no reason to do a charitable lead trust, maybe, you know? So, and again, you know, there's the re, I can't emphasize enough the resources and the, one of the takeaways from this conversation, just get, do you guys just get a 30,000 foot view and just know there are things that are out there to deal with everything. Right, and um, if we switch to the next slide, I will we'll, you know, talk more about the impact of setting up these types of, based off the new proposals. And if you wanna share a little bit of your feedback on what are your thoughts and perspectives of what's going on now, with deductions and itemizing certain types of, you know, gifting strategies, but how does that really impact donors? Um, how does that really impact, you know, organizations and their thinking philanthropically? How do we approach and at least provide to the audience a little bit more clarity around these types of uh, strategies and, and how the tax changes are impacting decisions today? Uh, it, it, the, the really, really big impact won't be you know, going from 37% to 39.6% or something like that. The really big impact potential of these tax bills that are being proposed are, is the change in capital gains tax rates, particularly when you get above the million dollar mark. And so where charitable techniques can come into play is somebody might say, well, you know what, if I'm going to get 40 cents on the dollar taken out, why don't I give a little bit more of this to charity? And particularly when people have those concentrated assets that they have to sell or the business that they have to sell or that, you know, uh, vacation home, they finally, they're not using and they need to go ahead and sell off. They've got this capital gains rate. They don't want to pay 40% on it. You know, um, one of the things that we use charitable vehicles are one, you know, you get a, a great deduction and more can go to the charity and less to the government, but also you can use a charitable remainder trust to spread out the income over 20, 30 years or whatever your life expectancy is. What, what the Charitable Ranger Trust allows you to do is sell an asset that has a large gain in it and spread out the income uh, for your lifetime or your spouse's lifetime or however it's set up. And Seth's got all kinds of creative ways to do, you know, structure those trusts. But it basically gets you the chance to defer that over many years, which if you've got this huge tax bracket increase, which is being proposed, might save a lot of money, not just because of the deferral, but because you're staying in a 
15 or 20% long-term capital gains rate, not a 40, you know, 39.6% tax rate, which could apply in the future uh, if some of these bills are passed. Uh, some other things to think about is we don't really know how these tax rates might apply to trust in the states. You know, are they going to be hit with these larger long-term capital gains rates? They very well might. So consider adding clauses in your garden variety, your family trust that you set up. Don't forget the charity and your garden variety, AB trust, your trust for kids and stuff like that. Don't you want to encourage your kids to make charitable contributions? Well, we have a clause in the trust that allows them to make charitable contributions from the trust that you set up for them because they might get a much better deal tax deduction wise having that distribution be made from the trust instead of from their own pocket. Uh, as Seth knows, you know, the trusts that are non-grantor trust have a unique kind of tax deal for charitable donations. You can offset up to 100% of the trust income and it's an above the line deduction that reduces your net investment surtax. It's, and in, if you live in a state like New York, you know, it can even reduce state income tax or Ohio or something like that. Now in Florida, you guys don't worry about that, but you know, it's considerably better in a lot of different respects. So, you know, build that flexibility in your trust and don't forget the, you know, uh, charities in the mix, even for a trust that's primarily for individuals. Now, Seth, do you see more people considering this in, in their planning? I, you know, not as much as I should. Maybe that's something that could be no. my fault. Maybe I should be talking about that more, especially. Um, I'll bet my New York partners are seeing a lot of that. That's a big motivator there. It's surprising, so, but I, I, I don't see it used as much as it could be, I think, as well. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to send email around my firm right after this call. <laughs> <laughs> the New Yorkers are probably going to do it. Um, they have to be doing it. It's just the, the, new, the taxes are just ghastly up there. When you, when you, especially if you're in the city, you got another 8%, another 3%. You know, you could be over 51% on the tax. But let me ask you another question, which is another high tax, ask another high tax, um, potential high tax asset. What about IRAs? What do you do with IRAs? Oh, yeah. And, and that goes to the next slide, I think. I think we've got a slide on some differences with, with IRAs and donor advised funds is, you know, to the last point on this slide, Seth, you know, if once you reach 70 and a half, you know, you're and uh, you've got a really unique tax uh, technique and, and benefit that you can utilize that you can't when you're younger. And that is to be able to take an asset, uh, you know, a distribution straight from your IRA and have it go straight to the charity and it, and it kind of works like an above the line deduction. It's not affecting your adjusted gross income, which impacts everything in your tax, you know, on your 1040, right? And so it's usually a much better deal to have the, your RMD or whatever, it doesn't have to be your RMD, it can be any amount up to $100,000, go straight to that, you know, straight to families first. You know, they get the check directly from, you know, Fidelity, Key Bank, US Bank, whoever it is that you got your IRA with, um, it can go straight to the, your favorite charity. And guess what? They don't get a tax bill. You know, <laughs> you know it's going to go straight from the IRA to the charity and they get a dollar on the dollar, not, you know, 70 cents on the dollar, 60 cents on the dollar. The key things you got to watch out for is it can't come from a 401k, can't come from a 403b, and you got to be above 70 and a half uh, to get that. But, and it's also, you know, when you're doing your estate planning, you keep that in mind too. The charities aren't going to pay money on receiving a IRA or 401k that's not a Roth, you know, that's traditional, but your kids would. So, you know, if you have two buckets of money to leave, you know, some's going to go to charity, some's going to go to kids, make sure that the charity gets the taxable money because they won't owe anything on it. And the, the kids get them, you know, the other money that they won't owe any tax on. And it's a win-win for everybody. Wonderful. What about just a couple more questions was, what about using an IRA? What about using this technique with the donor advice fund? Yeah, that's yeah, that's a problem too, Seth. You made a really good point to mention that is that's one of the few cases where we don't want to use a donor advised fund because for some reason Congress put in there that this qualified charitable distribution can't go to a private foundation and it can't go to your donor advised fund. It has to go to a public charity like Families First. So you keep that in mind on the IRA distributions. That's just dumb. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. <laughs> I'm There's some weird rules. Well, let me ask you. Last question is, how how good are IRAs? If you know, if say there's you have an IRA and you have 
uh, low basis stock and you could pass either one to your children, which is a better asset for, for the next generation to inherit an IRA or low basis stock? Well, you know, uh, that's changed in recent years, uh, Seth. And so I, we used to say probably that, you know, because people could get what they call the stretch on their IRA and, and, and get those distributions on the IRA over 30, 40, 50 years, but that got changed with the SECURE Act. You know, the, the family's only going to have to take it out over 10 years unless you're, you know, disabled or chronically ill or some exception. And so that probably tilts the, you know, analysis a little bit more to, you know, I think I'd rather leave the, you know, the family, the, the stock that gets a step up in basis, at least under the current law, right? And, and you know, rather than uh, IRA assets. Uh, so, you know, definitely it's a, it's a concern. I think if I had to, uh, you know, gift one or the other, I'd rather uh, gift the, the, the stock to the kids and to the IRA. You know, it sounds, like, it sounds, it sounds like a spreadsheet. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I see I've had some fun with uh, Excel spreadsheets on this before. Great nuggets, guys. And, you know, obviously, I hope the crowd was able to uh, benefit today by learning a little bit more about you know, techniques and strategies and just how to approach the tax law changes that are impacting giving and gifting um, towards philanthropy. Uh, with the sake of our time today, um, I think you guys did an amazing job. And um, you know, we welcome you guys to come back um, to our next series to talk more about what's going on in, in, in future future conversations that we're going to have based off of all the changes happening today. Um, but for the last couple of minutes that we do have, um, are, are there any questions from uh, the overall participants today or any last uh, comments that you guys want to just share before we wrap up um, in the next two minutes here? And if, and if you don't want to unmute, you can put something in the chat box. Uh, you know, you, you can remain anonymous if you want. <laughs> and did we have any last minute things? I don't know if there's a slide after this, too. I, I think that we pretty much went through everything. But uh, any, any last minute questions on? Well, we're going to call on people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think everyone who um, wants to receive further information, uh, we will be able to send over uh, directly in an email um, a little bit more information that the speakers have put together. And um, feel free to uh, reach out, uh, touch base with uh, your, your, your financial planning team, as well as uh, family first. Um, if you're thinking about new ways to uh, provide Maybe new strategies towards your you know, personal planning, your business planning, uh, just so you're at the forefront and thinking of families first um, with your actual planning discussions. Gentlemen, for the sake of our time today, uh, it was an honor to be on this panel with you guys, and uh, we look forward to seeing you guys again. But um, thank you so much again for both of your times, and uh, we look forward to you know the rest of the year and seeing how things change and impact us. Thanks for having us, Chris. Thanks, Chris. Appreciate all your time. It's an honor to be with you as well. And thank you to Families First for um, hosting this event. Um, and we look forward to um, seeing you guys again um, at our next series.